Hello, hello, hello. Here I am again. Uh, I just finished a brick painting. I'm going to show you. Uh, it's this one. I have been working on it from for a while now, and I thought it came out quite well. Uh, it's a little bit. I'm going to turn this off now. I'm just going to recalibrate the light here. So so there we are better lighting now you can see how it came out and i think i actually managed to get it quite right it feels like a brick uh, of course uh, this camera changes a lot of the colors when i film it this sorry to say but despite that, I think it came out pretty nice. I worked a lot with the shine and uh, trying to get it to... Uh, yeah. yeah, this is quite better, like this. See how the shine... I also worked a lot with the uh, textures and stuff to get that brick feeling. Uh, this is the brick. As you can see, it's quite vivid also. So it's more like this, I've been seeing it, a little like this. Uh, yeah, and uh, I'm quite pleased with it, actually. It's a long time since I painted a brick, and it's the first brick uh, tutorial I have on my YouTube channel. So I hope you like it. I hope you go to my Patreon, sign up for a dollar or whatever you like, and I will teach you how to paint if you need some inspiration um, I will also there's also a tier there I can Skype with you if you are willing to invest a little bit so go check it out it's a patron is a good place to communicate so yeah and I will also of course uh, answer your questions in comments uh, basic questions about painting and yeah have a chat so remember thumbs up very important share with your friends okay hope to see you yay so today i am starting to paint this brick on uh, uh, this canvas and it's a long time since i painted a brick i painted a lot of them before but i never actually filmed the process so this is the first one I'm actually going to do. So, with this, I hope you enjoy the process. Okay. So, the first thing I do is measure this thing, uh, how long a brick is. Just gonna measure it so I get it the right size. The composition is quite uh, important. I want to have it in the golden snit. There's about here and about here, and it will come down here. So I'm just gonna do. Uh, as you can see, I'm starting on as usual on the on a canvas that is uh, laced with uh, turp and raw umber. So, yeah. So that when I bring out and start painting, I can concentrate first about the light areas. Because this has a, a quite strong shadow. And uh, yeah, I always put light on the objects to get this uh, kind of overdone sense of um, of shape. I think it's more readable for my eyes when I do that. Uh, with readable, I mean I can even more easily see the shape. And uh, it's really helpful to me. 
why do I use Rotenburg? Usually it's Rotenburg from actually not from Old Holland. Old Holland is the paint I use. But I prefer to use for this purpose I prefer to use uh, Insa Newton because it's a more greenish color. This will also have a shine that goes down in because I have a glass. I have a glass plate that stands on. I like to have that shine, the double, double shine, uh, to make it kind of more, I don't know, more exciting, more even more difficult. So that's what I do. Uh, yeah. This is basically the first painting I'm doing after I was in this. No security prison in Norway in Kongsvinger because of my gun collection. I made guns from replica, just a hobby, but the police didn't like it very much. So I had to spend a few months in what I called my meditation resort, <laughs> and that is basically what it was. And I didn't, I didn't get my, I couldn't have my oil paint in there. Well, I, I got some oil paint in, but it was, it was a water-based oil paint. Uh, so yeah. Mm. This is just kind of the first rough layout of the sketch. I you can actually uh, what I did there was that I did a lot of drawing. A lot of drawing you've probably seen my my introdu new introduction video since I came out. The interview I put out uh, or the when I talk the self interview about the stay in the prison. Um, I wouldn't even call it a prison. Uh, so, well, it was uh, because there was a fence around it, but it was more like a, in the winter time, it was like a um, skiing resort. We didn't have skis actually, but we could have had. So. And I started drawing. The first time I started drawing for 25 years. And I became quite good at it actually. It uh, surprised me. In the beginning I was just fumbling around because I didn't know how to use pencils. But after a while I figured out how to how to put down the different layers to make shadows and and how to kind of scavur over the background slightly so to get the background to stay in the back. And I had to learn it uh, like I <laughs> Learned it, learned painting the first time, and when I came out, I had a bunch of pretty nice drawings, so and some paintings with my with my water-based oil paint. So yeah, it's kind of sad that I actually don't have a studio there that the prisoners could actually work in. They used to have that. They used to have some art thing. Uh, they didn't anymore so I think that was a dumb thing anyway uh, as you can see here I just kind of get it going and um, just adding subtracting trying to get it right and then I will use a lot of time to mold all the different textures and stuff. And that is what I love to do. That is why I paint. I, there's no other reason why I do this than actually um, getting it right. So. You mustn't. When you paint, you mustn't just twink around and try to get everything perfect. As you can see here, this I'm not doing any 
I'm not stressing with detail or anything, I'm just trying to get it approximately right and then I will start building on top of that. And this canvas was quite uh, rough actually, so it's going to cost me a few pencils. Go ahead. That's how it is. Now over here is a yellow greenish and there is quite reddish, so uh, that's also good. That's why I chose this, uh, one of the reasons why I chose this brick, because it has basically some complementary contrast in it. And there's a lot, a lot of nuance to work on. And it's quite cool. It's what I call a real brick. There's even a, even a name on top of it and it's really burned nicely. You can't get these anymore, you have to buy them. Um, or find them yourself somewhere. Because they don't make bricks like this anymore. You can actually get 40 corner for them. And that is like, so right now it's like $4 a brick. Uh, a friend of mine told me. So. But of course I get a lot more for this painting than anyone would get for a brick. Well, I can't show you the whole process. But if you follow my channel, you've probably seen the whole process before. So, so I'm going to just measure it. Like this. Yeah, that was actually quite right. And just like this plus the on top. So it was actually correctly in the size and I think it's in a good place in canvas. I don't think I will have any problems with the composition. And uh, that is just going bang on. Just keep painting until I feel that it has the right hue. some broader or bigger pencils for this work. So I'm just going more down here. That is Things I will work on. So I'm not concerned. Yeah, I think that will do for this segment. My foot actually hurts. It's a bitch. That's how it is. When you train too much for too many years. Okay. Okay, here we are with another segment. Uh, so you have been working a little bit on it. And uh, just need some oil medium. Uh, I use 70% turp and 30% uh, uh, 
cleansed oil, cooked cleansed oil actually, because if you use raw, it will basically never dry. I painted and did an Instagram live session, and I actually took, uh, saved the video, so I might also put this into this video, but I'm not sure. So I just I jumped to this, I didn't, uh, but I thought it became quite quite okay clip because they talk about basically how painting can give you a, a sense of meaning in in the obvious meaninglessness of life. But anyway, I'm going to talk about painting in this one. As you can see, I'm just filling in, filling in the background. Uh, I noticed here that I should have maybe had one more layer of gesso on it because it's the surface is a little bit like sandpaper in this, which means that I burn through more, more of the brushes. But yeah, but done is done. I'm not gonna tell you know, because now it's too late. I can't after putting that tone on it, it's not anyway bad because it is actually oil and mint. Kind of, despite me not using much in the glaze, I use uh, well, not glaze, but the, when I tone the canvas. I use turpentine and Hohenbach, as I told you. But it, it is oil paint, so if I had some gesso on top of that, that would actually fall off because that's water based and this is oil based, so that wouldn't work. I do have, as I said in the last segment, I do have. Um, some water-based oil, oil paint, and, but it's actually quite good. Uh, the only problem was that I couldn't glaze with them. And uh, since I couldn't glaze, I can really finish any, any um, figure paintings. My, in prison, so but I did a lot of drawings and you know stuff which I've been talking about anyway. Maybe I should stop talking about the prison thing now and uh, let that be in the past. Now, as you can see, I'm working now in, in directions, I'm gonna try to put on some more. Uh, some more paint to get a more painted surface because I think it's getting a little bit too too thin. I like it to be a little bit more yeah, a little bit more thickness in the paint. And here also it's going to be reddish behind here because it's, that's what is right there. And the thing is to work with these nuances until it becomes uh, like I wanted to. See? Just going to fill it out and then I'm going to take a little break and put some more fresh colors on my canvas, not on my palette I mean, sorry, and then I will do another segment where I do more details in the sketch or make it a little bit more, uh, getting the shape right and stuff. So.
just love this painting stuff. It's the most gratifying thing. I have been learning a lot about uh, autism lately, or Asperger's as they used to call it. Actually they don't call it that, they call it uh, Spectre or something. But I think maybe, maybe I do have a lot of traits. Because no matter, okay, I want to talk a little bit more about the prison thing because in there they saw looked at me as a little bit crazy, and that was be, not because I did anything crazy stuff. I didn't. I just the way I talk and all the the things I like to talk about. You know, I like to talk about life. I like to talk about science. I like. I'm not able to do much small talk or anything like that. I don't. I don't like to speak, talk about nothing. But other people are content with babbling about sports and babbling about even the weather. Who cares about the weather? You know, in the winter time we complain that it's too cold, and in summer time people complain it's too hot. Actually. For me, I like it. I like the cold actually better than too warm. It might be because my ancestors came from where the Vikings used to live, and maybe had something to do with open boats and the climate where I come from. But I mean, talking about things. It has no meaning. I just zone out. I just I, I'm not even there. So yeah, I've always been like that. When I was a welder, I was told I was too strange to be a welder. I should do something more creative. And when I went into art, I managed also to alienate most of the artists because if I think something is the Emperor's New Clothes, uh, I say so, I say my opinion, and I really don't have in me the capability of, of uh, being excited by mediocre artists who making conceptual art and things that I think they are better than basically Leonardo da Vinci because they are freer and all this bullshit, you know. I kind of just give my opinion. And Norway is a very small country, so if you if you have some more radical ideas about art and radical today is actually pointing out when the emperor has no clothes because in, in art, in the art scene, it's very, very based on, on some kind of collective narcissism uh, it is a lot of empathy faking, there's a lot of political faking, you know, these people doesn't really care they always throw themselves on the on the political correct bandwagon there's very little critical thinking around their own political views and uh, I mean even the George Floyd case was a good example of that because everybody threw them off that bandwagon that this policeman willfully killed this guy and the fact is that he actually probably died of an overdose, or uh, would have died of an overdose anyway, and he simply was no hero. He was a uh, uh, criminal, he had threatened a woman, a pregnant woman with a gun, he had done a lot of other stuff, and he wasn't a hero. 
is it doesn't matter. I don't, I don't mean that you deserve to die, of course, but the point is that the amount of fentanyl in the system was so large that it was killed several men. And he, his respiratory problems probably came from that and not what the cop did. And by the way, even if there was the cop who did that mistake, it wasn't premeditated. It was not a premeditated murder and it was not racist based. So I think it's just such bullshit that every single artist that I know of true themselves on this simplistic story of Black Lives Matter and this was a murder and stuff like that. But I, I stood in the facts and I come to my own conclusion and I say so and I get alienated from most people actually because they have these these more radical ideas who is not based in any race or anything like that I just think that we should follow the facts and that cop who got sentenced I think he's innocent of the main sentence it wasn't he wasn't one he didn't want to kill the guy so I think um, Stuff like that, and, and you know, artists always throw them on these political correct views. Also, I, I the first time Trump was going to become president, going to be president, I actually supported him because of his stance on China and stuff. I changed my mind since then because he's against uh, helping Ukraine to battle, um, to battle new Stalin in Russia, Putin. So I can't support him now. I'm Norwegian anyway, so I'm not voting, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, but anyway, I would think it would be funny if he won. I think it would be hilarious actually, but you know, I rather see him lose than letting Putin run amok. So, yeah. But when I do take these, as a humanist, I'm a humanist, I'm an atheist, humanist, uh, I'm basically on the left, I would say, you know, if I should look at myself on some political specter because I I care about the poor. I think every human being should have a right to or we should be forced to support poor people and feed every child and all that even if it actually cost us a little bit more expensive luxury goods which is probably the only thing we would notice. Uh, and um, we could put a tax on every luxury goods and we could there's so many things we could do and then help people poor people all over the world to reach a point where they can actually live up to their personal their own personal their human potential it's a very sad thing that we are losing so much consciousness to reckless behavior by the richest in the world. So, yeah, I, and with the riches, I mean the whole West, not the rich in the West, but the West in general. So, yeah. Anyway, uh, now you see I just went over it. I made this sketch. I talk about everything else but painting. So no wonder my, my channel is so incredibly popular. But I am kind of an idealist 
nature, so I will just keep suffering. Anyway, I will now just take a small break, fill up this palette with paint, fresh paint, and um, start doing more molding. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. Yeah, another layer, a layer, but not more. I'm going to do some more uh, detail, try to get it right. And then I will, of course, start molding the, the textures. Uh, yeah, as you see, I just glaze over a little bit. That is also something I do several times in the process. I do glaze, I do over paint, I create uh, some textures, then I let it dry, then I glaze and uh, uh, start doing even more, uh, even more details and and textures and stuff like that. It's a kind of a, it's a very nice dynamic process. Um, I can actually feel how I am able to look into the future and see how different things will manifest manifest in the future, and that. Kind of leave, it gives me some kind of a calm uh, feeling when I paint. I don't I don't need to stress that much because I know that a painting is basically the sum of all the times I've been touching it and uh, time. So it's, it's very nice. It's a nice feeling. It's liberating, it's uh, soothing. So, yeah. I'm using, you know, uh, so I saw this artist that I actually like very well. But he was talking about the values, and he's quite good. He's doing portraits, uh, Asian guy, Philippines or something, I'm not really sure. Uh, but he is doing very nice portraits and stuff. There's just one thing, uh, and he's good. I mean, he's good at drawing and good at and the likeness and everything. But I kind of miss a little bit more, kind of a little more paintedness, uh, a little more texture. And it talks a lot about that, or talks about value. I mean, all the nuances and shadows and stuff, but for me, it becomes a little bit, how to say it, a little bit boring. Uh, unlike the more the Rembrandt, kind of rough, rough, rough and tumble type of way, uh, where you can see all the brushwork and uh, and see the process which he has been clearly going through. It's very important to me. So yeah. That is my goal anyway. Just gonna now let it slide into and make some of the the background just disappear. Uh, I want a very hard line behind. That's also the thing you do over time. First, I paint in the things that help me. Oh, it's actually there. My eyesight is actually getting better, and that's a good sign. 
I used to have to have glasses on when I paint, but I can see now I don't actually don't need glasses anymore. It might be due to my uh, I lost like I went from 83 kilos to 76 or 77, gained a lot of muscle mass, and. Uh, Probably balance out my my um, blood sugar, and actually that can lead to better eyesight and better repair in your eyes. Because now it's clear. This is quite clear. I can see the palette, and it's a very good feeling actually. It's a long time since I since I saw this. Good. And all of this happened when I was in prison. <laughs> uh, and uh, because I had a very good focus on my health and which I usually I thought I was doing but I, all the all the um, the focus and all the all the routines affected my stress levels and Stuff. Of course, being a place with a lot of strange, <laughs> a lot of people who might not be called normal. Now, actually, I was one of the people in there that other prisoners thought was a little bit crazy. Not in a bad way, but because I like to talk about philosophy and and stuff like that, so they thought I was a little bit strange. You know, I met a lot of good people, and some of them were actually very much capable of abstract thinking, but usually in a prison, or at least where I was, there was, a, they're, they're basically, you know, alpha male kids who has lost track of their lives during the drugs or something else. So you meet people who can be a little bit aggressive and uh, but not, not I didn't meet many psychopaths. So maybe some some light sociopaths but not not the real bad ones you know there was a couple of people who I stayed away from but yeah so so all in all uh, the stay there I did everything I was up in the morning I was doing cold showers I was fasting I was working in the in the workshop with a wood uh, like a carpenter and uh, I did my exercise and in the evenings I did my writing and drawing uh, I wasn't so much social actually especially the last, the last months I just started to get tired of people and I focused basically on my health and my drawing and stuff and I think it basically focused my whole being. I met a guy actually today in the gym that said, wow, he said, I heard it before because people I meet now saw me, that saw me a year ago, they say, wow, what happened to you? You look totally different. You look stronger. You look even taller. And that is probably because staying in this prison uh, actually created a situation where my growth hormone and testosterone went up because of the uh, kind of not threatening situation but you can you can feel that you are among men which is a little bit yeah off so me being probably more I probably refer to me like an alpha and more, more, maybe more like a sigma 
because I don't need to, I don't have the need to uh, have power or need to uh, push put people down in any way or dominate other people. I don't have that thing in me. I don't want power. I want only power over myself. But I mean, it kind of triggered the warrior genes in me. I can even feel my hands got bigger because there were some rings I had used to wear that I can't even get on my fingers anymore. <laughs> so I think actually the growth hormone and from the fasting, cold showers, and all this actually made my skeleton grow a little bit. Which actually higher growth hormone does to you. That's a known fact. I okay, I, I do rant a lot about stuff when I paint. Just sticking to painting is quite hard for me because it's basically something I do all the time. And um, I try to teach you stuff. So it's actually better if you watch my videos and you can ask me questions in the comments or you can also go to of course Patreon and sign up there and I will personally help you to evolve your painting. Uh, I try to, you know, see, I, I, do, I do use darker colors. I use uh, actually a lot of blue especially um, French Ultramarine to tone things down. I'm not a fan of using too much, uh, too much uh, black because it tend to kind of make the colors feel a little bit dead and I'm more into having it to feel a little bit more alive. I like yeah, I like surfaces that kind of lives. So yeah. Now I'm gonna move this a little bit in here. There's a kind of what's in behind here is a kind of a wooden some wood I found many years ago. Uh, and uh, I think it's it's kind of a, a redwood or something. I I'm not sure, but it's very nice to use as a background tone. So I will, you know, show that there's something behind there, but I won't go. The, the most of the details when you do a painting, figurative painting, you have to choose which objects you want to be the most present. Of course, when I paint the background. You can see I'm going over it again and again and again, but I also um, I also keep it down because to build this thing more like a sculpture, it has to be have the thickest colors in the light and then in the details, and then you have to shade out fade out, so you get more like this sculptural focus on where the light is going to be. Well, yeah, that is basically the whole secret. And I see many people paint, they are very scared of using these uh, effects. You can see Rembrandt was brilliant in using these effects. Um, Also, I need to use in here is more yellowish, greenish, and then it goes behind there and becomes a little bit more, a little bit warmer. But it it, ha it doesn't have it mustn't collide with the tone in the in the. Uh, since it's glass, I'm keeping this down. There's not going to be much texture there because it's glass, and uh, I'm just going to keep. I'll go into smaller and smaller detail there to get this shine. I will also, of course, go over it like this, tone it down. You know, this can't, this shine can't be 
as present as, as this because a shine in a glass thing is totally different from the real object so this is just going to be a yeah a shine uh, and we'll keep it down in a different way I have to give it light areas here and stuff like that but I'm gonna keep it down keep it down <laughs> so yeah that is basically now I'm talking about this prison thing and of course it's gonna drive my mother insane because she don't, doesn't want me to tell the story but I think I I, I, I believe in more extreme honesty and uh, there are other things too that I you know, tell everyone but I'm, I am actually writing about, about uh, the stay and, uh, and the thoughts about it and uh, I may reveal more personal stuff in, in that book someday. Uh, I think if you're gonna if you're gonna portray yourself or make a biography or something, if it's gonna be interesting. Now, why would a biography of a baby? I, I have I have had some media stuff and been kind of known in Norway, but you know who would be interested in in, a, in an artist. Fairly unknown artist biography. Well, only if if my struggles and my the things that made me happy resonates with other people's things or problems or struggles. So a biography can actually be interesting for people if it has some impact on their own struggles and can help maybe focus it a little bit so but you know why should one write a biography or write why should you believe that you are important enough for anyone to bother? Well, I'm not. The answer is that simply I'm not. And when it comes down to it, I think it's I'm doing it more for my own sake. It's like I write diaries and I've been having been writing since I was I started in doing art. I did it in in childhood actually because I I was a little bit bullied and stuff and I couldn't sleep at night and stuff so I I did do some writing then just thoughts and stuff but I started up again when I started doing art because like who was it said you have to write your life there was some artist who said that that it's very important to write down and that is also what I tell my daughter. I mean, if you if you want to get to know yourself and kind of remember the process, because when we when we change, we often forget forget how we were. But if you have all the writings from, I mean, mine mine go back now from to nineteen. 89 I started and that is basically 19 over 30 years with writing and I can see how my personality has changed over time how deeper layers of understanding has basically made me more empathic and more considerate and even how this, I, I wrote probably about a thousand pages in prison. 
all, probably over that. And uh, much of us, it was about heartbreak, it was about uh, what happened in there, what my thoughts about life and thoughts about what I should focus on when I got out and, and stuff like that. So yeah, it's, it's, uh, it was really a, a journey. Uh, and I'm glad I did, actually. Also wrote a lot of letters and stuff, so... Which I actually need to get a copy of. Well, that's another story for another day. That's what I said. So, yeah. It's so funny that there is actually adversity and, and struggle that make a person become fully conscious and fully a full human being. Uh, it's just psychologist guy called Larkin something on YouTube and he talks a lot about narcissism and psychopathy and stuff like that and and um, yeah I forgot the point <laughs> I went into the painting here I forgot the point yeah, well, no, maybe it was it was because I basically needed to find out who am I, uh, and uh, yeah, yeah, that was it. He talks about people, people who aren't conscious. That was the that was the thing I was looking for. People who are you know, being conscious is, it's deeper than people think. Now, you're not conscious just because you drive your car to work. You're not conscious just because, well, you're conscious, but you aren't really in touch with your deeper layers just because you are able to get food into your mouth and get a paying job and and get an education. Consciousness. He calls them, you know, they they look alive, they act alive, they talk like they are alive, but it's not really anyone there because they haven't gone deeper into introspection. So he called them zombies. He calls most people zombies. And you might think that that is a very harsh thing to say. But in a way it's very true. And the, the, the scariest thing is that you can't really know if you're one of them. Am I one of them? Am I a zombie? Or am I conscious? Or am I just tricking myself into being, believing I'm conscious? Am I a good person? Or am I just pretending? Uh, yeah. And, you know, that is the things I was actually uh, going through in, in, in prison. Now, I, say, I keep saying prison. The prison in no way is, uh, the prison I was in was a low security. There was a fence around it, but it was a nice place with with a nice gym and the guards were great and it was it was really a, a good place to be. It was like like you couldn't even pay for this shit, okay? It's it's like you go there, people pay to go to a to a meditation room. Really. That's why I call it my meditation resort. You know they pay to go to meditation resorts. But I but you can leave then. You can leave the meditation resort, but you can't leave here. So it makes the whole experience, shall we say, more real. And uh, you have to deal with it in a different way than if you just bought yourself a ticket to Tibet and sat on a monastery for a year. Uh, this is different. Very different. So, 
it's, it's supposed to be a very good thing for me. Very good thing. It's the best thing that probably could happen to me. And it's so strange because I was looking out the window. Actually, I, this was... I did some some paintings from, from the view. This was basically the view I had from my room. Over This is just a sketch, it's an hour sketch or something like this, in Kongsvinger, Norway. And uh, I have a lot of them actually. And I was looking out that window every day and I thought, you know, is this ever going to end? And now it's almost two months since I came out of it and it feels like it's two bloody years. It's almost like I never were there. And it's such a weird feeling. Maybe that is why people keep going back, you know, criminals and stuff, because when you get out, you just don't, it doesn't compute. We're not really there. <laughs> but anyway, I'm not a criminal, i am just had a weapon collection and I rebuilt some replica, 70 replica guns. And um, I got my charge for breaking the Norwegian gun laws in a massive way so um, um, I'm not a criminal I didn't hurt anyone I didn't sell anything I didn't earn anything money and I just a bloody hobby like this it was like the, what got me into prison was basically my creativity and, and my no, my nosy my my um, hyperactive mind and my curiosity is I like your curiosity killed the cat in a way, you know. I went a little bit too far out on the edge and I guess I fell off. And um, prison was a very good way to lead me back to the right track or the right. So, yeah, I have to say it was not bad thing at all so anyway there was a lot of ranting about my life which is actually I think become more and more interesting as I go along and I will keep on living and evolving I guess in you know, the time I've left so life is full of surprises isn't it and uh, here I am Back in my studio, doing my thing, like nothing happened. And I can only say, beautiful, yeah, simply beautiful. Life is beautiful. Okay. We'll keep on molding this. A few hours and then I will do the next second. Okay, see you later, alligator. So, here we are. I am working with uh, more detail in the sketch of the brick. I'm just going to zoom in a little bit so you can see better what I'm actually doing uh, like this and like this because I'm approximately gonna, just going to work with with uh, brick uh, now it is wet and wet so it's just to kind of mold some more uh, actually I don't need my glasses now 
just gonna see if I can build some more basic gazelle, gazelle, is it gazelle it's called? It has this strange name. You can see these sketches of the old masters where they haven't actually put in much color. It's just neons. Now I work in a totally different way. I go straight into color. As I say, I am not into just working slowly, slowly with value from the beginning. I just pour the paint in, and then I, uh, yeah, let's just start molding and give it value after the fact. Uh, it's a risk. It takes. Uh, uh, it's a different process. Actually tonight I'm a little bit tired. I wasn't that yesterday and my eyesight was way better. So when I don't sleep enough I tend to eat my glasses the day after. And uh, my sleep schedule has been a little bit out of whack lately. Yes. Yes. So a lot of stuff happening in this old brick. Bricks are like driftwood. They bear the stamp of time. Everything that happened to it. And many bricks actually they have been used many times. And uh, yeah. This brick was from an old house they pulled down, and uh, I don't think it was even legal to pull it down. So there was a lot of bricks there, and I picked up some some of the beautiful ones. I have this thing for everything natural, so everything that reminds me of the basic rules of nature and uh, I think uh, kunsch, bricks, driftwood, uh, plants, you know, everything that actually reminds me of the law of thermodynamics, craniums, everything of that sort is very fascinating to me. Maybe I should be a little bit close to it, but I can do that next time. Because then I can actually... It's very difficult to paint with the glasses on, because you tend to... When I look at the palette, or look at the object, it's kind of there in the way. I look at this and I kind of need them. But I only think I need to take a little step back and it's clear. So I just have to cope. I guess. the green and the, and the orange. It's a lot of, it's a very warm painting, this one. Mm. 
tone it down again. And so some blue. Fascinating. I love this. It's observing. Every time I look at it, I pick up some new information and I kind of moves it from my head then all the way over to, to the object here or the painting. It's like strange actually how we humans are put together. By evolution, it's kind of, it's almost like I'm, I'm doing it in a partitioned way. Almost like pixels. I check a little bit here, a little bit there. Observe. I put it into my brain. I try to find this, find a solution uh, in the color, the hues, everything to. Oh. work back and forth with it it's amazing the brain is just I mean you have to have introspection to do this a monkey couldn't do this because they don't have the brains uh, they don't have the amount of introspection that would actually find this meaningful and <laughs> you think about it, maybe it's a good thing you know, because what is actually the point of this what is the point of painting a brick what is the point of art what is the point of basically anything and <laughs> when you think about it, this becomes more and more absurd that I am actually standing here with the brain that it took the universe four billion years to create through evolution by natural selection we went through the dinosaurs, we went through eons of time uh, reptiles and uh, one-celled organisms that roamed the seas for four billion years to create enough oxygen so that we could move on to the land and then we could evolve into lizards and then to no not lizards yeah yeah lizards and then to to dinosaurs and then to mammals and then to these tiny mice that survived the cataclysmic thing you know and the meteor extinct got rid of the dinosaurs and then we come into the equation and we our ancestors were fighting for survival for hundreds and thousands of years millions of years depending on how far you go back and now I'm standing here as a result of this four billion long billion year long evolution in a universe that is probably infinite where time even doesn't make any sense uh, it just is and I'm painting a brick now how about that it's ridiculous really all existence is just weird even if there were gods, it would be weird. What's the point? What's the point of this brick? When you start to think like that, you might just kill yourself, you know. Because everything loses meaning. And you are left with, basically, just an absurdity. Just a feeling. I'm left with just a feeling of feeling alive through doing creative work while I wait to go back to non-existence. So 
So I just think the whole thing is absurd to a level of yeah absurdity. You know, if if at least if there were any were life after death or something, or there was something more, some point to this. I mean, as Carl Sagan did say, we are the way for the universe to know itself. And yeah, we are. But what's the point in the universe knowing itself? Why should that be important? So, this, this, it's, it's just absurd. No matter how you think about it, you, you hit that brick wall of, of absurdity. No wonder if people create religions, you know, or deities to kind of soothe the pain of nothingness. So, you know, as I said before, if, I mean, even painting life, everything being totally ridiculous and pointless, We can kind of enjoy it if we create some positive distractions. Life becomes in a way eternal or infinite or death doesn't matter the moment you are able to forget death for a while for freaking you see I started to I, I don't even know where this started because I started talking about painting and then I go to the universe and then I go over to infinity and pointlessness and the absurdity of life and on a, on a, on a different day I could be like we are the way for the universe to know itself now how amazing is that we give the universe meaning through us and that is so beautiful, I could say, on a good day. It's not a bad day, actually, today. But then I could equally say the opposite. What's the point? Why bother? So, it's kind of a dualistic existential crisis I'm actually working with every single day. Trying to get through this. And yeah, that's what I'm going to keep on doing until I, as Christopher Hitchens said, until I drop. And he dropped, and I will drop, and so will you. So, yeah. I was gloomy, but that's the truth. As one of the Stoics did say, death doesn't matter because when you're when you're alive. Only life matters, and when you're dead, you're dead. Nothing matters. Hopefully, or maybe, probably. Now, if there is a life after death, I have no idea how that would work. Oh, what? Now. If there should be any meaning, it would have been that the universe, our true chemistry, evolution, creates the aim of the universe is to create as much consciousness as possible to see itself. So the universe would be kind of the ultimate narcissist 
which through a chemical process in time creates living beings just for the purpose to see itself. And in the process these beings have to, to struggle with doubts if there is any meaning. And the universe doesn't even reply, it doesn't tell us, yeah, there is meaning, this is the meaning. You are supposed to be conscious, as much conscious as you can, so that, I, so that you can see me more. And you are actually me, and I am me, and you are me, and yeah. So that would be the goal of the universe. Or the goal. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's just nuts, the whole thing. I'm just gonna go kill myself now. I'm just kidding. <laughs> that was actually a thought that came bumping into my mind. Because, you know, what's the point? What is the point? And I can guarantee you, it's not like the Christian says or the Muslim says. And if that God actually existed, I would fight him and also for the death of hell anyway. Because he's not a good, he's not a good entity. I sucker. I wasn't, I didn't ask to be born. And now you want me to bend my knee for a sin I didn't, I didn't even be a part of? Gee, man. Get out of here. Now, if you're going to live, you need freedom. And the best, one of the best ways to reach that is basically freedom from religion. Freedom from the absurd. And you get the question, does it make me happy to be realistic? Well, I don't think the religious are happy either. As Christopher Hitchens did say, the problem with religion is that religious is that they they can't leave you alone. They are not. They need you to believe what they believe to confirm their egos. So, yeah. I actually think religion are the ultimate narcissist. God sees me, I'm special. Yeah. Well, well, well. So, that is what I'm thinking about when I, when I fake meaning by creating pointless paintings. But I have to know, you have to know. It gives me solace, it gives me flow, it gives me nirvana, it gives me a certain, a certain peace. And in the absurdity of existence, I think that is actually good enough, because I'm not planning to leave. 
I'm planning to stick around, if not only for seeing what happens. Yeah. And what happens is quite predictable, actually. But, you see. What you do in life will be reflected in eternity. Isn't that what Marcus Aurelius did say? And in the movie Gladiator, he repeats it before they go into battle. What you do in, it, in life goes in eternity. So, show courage in the light of, of absurdity. And um, get your shit together. Yeah, that's the verse Gisel. Yes. So, with this, I rest my case. <coughs> okay. Here we are. I'm going to put on layer number two. First, I'm going to use the retouche vernis as I do in every every video. Here is this retouche vernis. <coughs> as you see, uh, the canvas is quite uh, kind of pale-like, or there's much shine in it. Actually, one of the problems with paintings like this is that you get a lot of shine. And the oil and the, and the furnace in the end, but you can actually, yeah, this is too loose actually. I need to tighten it a little bit, it's not the best uh, stuffily I have, but it's good enough. Now, I put on this. You see uh, the different nuances. Now I can see more detail. It's easier for me to choose the new colors and uh, see the whole surface. What I do next, I let this dry now for a little while, for like 10 to 15 minutes. Then I put on a glaze and I'm going to show you that's the next step. And then I remove some of the glaze and then I just start working on top of it. Now you can see actually how you can more see the depth and stuff after I did that. It's very important for these kinds of paintings to be able to see where you are going. Okay, it has dried for a little while and uh, it's kind of sticky and that's the whole point because the stickiness will make the retouche vernis. No, not the retouche vernis, I mean the glaze. I use uh, French ultramarine and alzarine, or crap black, or something like that, because it gives a kind of a darker tone. And blue is a very good place. Blue-ish, is, I think, is a very good glaze because it kind of toned down all the colors, or also the orange in the brick, everything here. Just and what happens when I do this is that I get more of the textures to come out, which makes it easier for me to kind of, uh, uh, see them, just see them, yeah. Uh, and it's almost like I, I add more shadow to the dark places. And of course I will paint over it, all of it. So most of the glaze actually disappears into the new paint but it is almost like like some of it basically stays there you know it's 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 almost like every time you touch something it gains a little bit more uh, substance or textures or whatever also it's good to when I put some oil, because I, what I use to glaze with, it is my medium, which is a 70% terp, 17, as you call it in Norway, and 
30% linseed oil, about that mix. Uh, you can of course find your own mix. Yeah. I wouldn't recommend using too much oil in it in the beginning because uh, if you're going to put on many layers of paint it is way better to uh, not having the, the canvas or the surface to be too oily too soon because then all the time it can actually crack up a little bit and stuff like that so I've heard but it will take a long time so it probably won't happen in your lifetime so I guess it's gonna be the conservationists problem if you make paintings that they find worth taking care of in the future and of course there is never any guarantee for that so but you know, who cares but anyway, uh, what I do now is that I scrape, as you see now, I scrape away my blades. And, uh, and now I get more, I get, I kind of try, try to scrape away more here, so I get more of the light areas back. And I'm going to show you closer. Maybe I should post this glazing thing as a standalone video because I get a lot of questions about it. So we can actually see the process. Uh, also, when I do this, I scrape away the excess oils. And the oil that then is left is more into the cracks and into the textures. So I don't, also don't get too much of an oily surface. Now the, the retouche vernis also makes it stick. If you do this without the retouche vernis, I think it becomes a little bit slippery when I start uh, uh, painting on top of it. But with the use of the retouche vernis first, let it dry for 10 or 15 minutes. Not all dry, but almost dry. Uh, these two mixes together, so it becomes sticky. So when I put a new new paint, it just starts to go like this because it's too much oil. I actually get the problem getting the the color to stick to the surface, and we do not want that. So I can paint on this immediately. Uh, I want to paint on the whole, most of the surface, especially the light areas and, and the details, before it dries. Uh, the other parts, not that important, uh, but also want to use the opportunity to let the oil and the retouche vernis mix into the new color so it dries faster and it kind of sticks more to the surface. So that is the process I do uh, when it comes to the retouche vernis. I've done this a hundred times in my videos but uh, I showed it in every video so people don't have to jump around and see every video and every video is a little bit different I think actually this was one of the best explanations I've done of, the, of this so I think I want to post this as a standalone video before I post the whole thing so you can actually learn a little bit from it yeah okay then I'll see you in the next segment where I start painting. Or if it's a standalone, I will see you in the full tutorial, which comes to my channel. Yeah, I forgot a little bit of the detail. I want to go closer to it so you can actually see how it looks after my glaze. Uh, how the different textures actually oh, come on, motherfucker. Yeah, okay. Okay, here we go. I'm gonna start uh, doing layer number two. Yeah, and uh, 
don't really need my glasses today. It's a good thing. It's always a good thing when my eyes are better. So I'm just going to start with um, a thinner pencil. I'm going to do what I usually do. I start with the, with the light areas. That's the best thing to do. But you have to have a starting point. That's very important to uh, and I always start with the light areas, especially when it's only a sketch like this one. Uh, and you see, I just uh, have some white in it, and I, I um, yeah, I just uh, try to find out. Now, now, of course, going more into detail, I'm going to start shaping the brick better. That's a slower process, the sketching, and the sketching process for me now, at this point, is relatively fast. Uh, it's not the hardest part. The hardest part is always when I go deep, deep, deep into detail. Uh, so, and that is actually a few glazes away. Now I see I don't have any uh, whole, whole sienna on this palette right now and I should maybe have that because it's uh, I can use actually I, I take some some ultramarine blue that I put into the orange and kind of tones it down a little bit. I just have to kind of figure out exactly how much is necessary get a more neutral color. As you can see my my paintings are quite uh, explosive when it comes to color even for paintings that are basically more classical oriented. I do not have a I don't have this um, need to keep it down. I, I like it to be a little bit extrovert, if that's what I say. I like to come out to the... To, so I like to kind of keep parts of it inside, but I also like it to feel, when it's done, I like it to feel like the brick is actually there. So that it is, they're not on just a, so on a surface level like a photograph, but that is actually there uh, more sculptural and painted so yeah that is why I keep on adding thicker and thicker colors where where the lighter areas are the most the areas that are going to be you know, kind of come out or be more in the light so I think it probably how the Classes and classics were thinking when they did sculptures that they actually thought that okay I have to take away this much clay or this much stone to make the light actually hit those areas first so that I get this illusion of uh, of depth and stuff. Of course when it's a sculpture and you work around it of course it will be, be 3D anyway but even they have to get the depth right and, and everything. More, maybe it's more related to the relief when uh, I need actually some medium. To a relief where you have to create more, create like shadows or on a, on a more 2D and carve out from the stone or from wood or whatever you have to carve out the shapes and it, I, I kind of feel that I, I do feel that I, I actually make reliefs when I do my paintings uh, instead of removing stone I'm basically adding stone uh, yeah it's like I should make a relief from clay 
It's the same process, the same thing I would do. The only difference is here I do it also with color. So if I did it with clay, there would of course not be that amount of color. I guess you can probably mix in color into the clay. And uh, but then I will be painting with clay, I guess. So yeah, that's what I do. That's what I do, yay. Now I'm gonna try not to get into too much rambling about existence and everything, but it's also very in every segment it's tempting to do so because it's the things I actually think about when I do paint very often life and stuff. So yeah. But here as I said many times before, uh, an object like a brick, I have to scratch my ear, sorry. That's how it is sometimes, we have to scratch our ears. That's part of being human. Um, we are animals after all and get things into our ears like all the animals. That was a digression. That was a total digression. So, I don't know. I don't know, even know what I was talking about. Yeah, I talked about the textures, and, but I did that, and of course, in other segments too. So what I'm going to do now is just... Maybe, maybe I should just shut up. But that would be boring, wouldn't it? See, I, I just pick up small... It's almost like I pick up... I said this before, of course. I'm going to stop saying that because I've said everything before in some form or another. Uh, but I pick up different uh, uh, shapes and pieces like I would uh, almost like a puzzle. I see different things and then I just, oh, there's, there's one. There's a shape, and then I say, ah, oh, there's another shape, and then I can, can I just drag it like this. And I think about directions all the time, you know, what kind of direction, which, which direction should I paint to create this twist, this twist, this, how, how, how do I use the pencil, what directions. There's so many things to think about when you paint, because I've seen people or more, I haven't got that kind of time behind their skills. They tend to twinkle a little bit too much. They tend to uh, smooth things out. And but I try to just pick up, pick up things piece by piece, then I knit it together, and in the end, all the touches over time becomes something that is closer and closer to the object I'm painting. And this is a brick. And uh, as I said also, the beautiful things about bricks is that they bear the stamp of time. And time is of the essence when it comes to natural things. I, <laughs> it was funny, I had a, this thing I talked to with this, this young guy at, at the gym today. <laughs> And he asked me about where I used the cane and stuff, and I told him that I, I had a double hip replacement because of overtraining over many years. I did way too much, and I just screwed up my hips, so I had to change them. And then, because of my hypomania, I also managed to fuck up one of the, the uh, you know, one of the prosthesis. The bone actually loosened a little bit from the prosthesis because of my me putting too much weight on my back and uh, when I did squats and I also got some problem in my back. But you know, as I told him that the thing about aging is that the body starts falling apart but you get smarter. And 
it's kind of a thing with with the brick also you know the more times it's used or the longer time since it was used it's not necessary that polished brick with no marks with nothing but it's brick with character it's, uh, it's gone through things so almost all, the same thing with personality you, you it's, it's personality to get personality I think you actually have to do a lot of mistakes and uh, you have to come to a point where you start seeing these mistakes and they get kind of tattooed into your, your personality and you start learning from them and you start becoming more human than human not more human than human but you start to live up the potential of what it is to be human what it is to be a conscious entity yeah, a person who stops lying to yourself and stop pretending and yeah that is what happens to to the personality over time when the same thing the body falls apart no doubt about it I can feel it I have some injuries all over the body but my mind has never been this good ever um, it's like a told my I should say your girlfriend that well first of all it's gonna last but I don't know you know my new muse or whatever that uh, she got the best version of me ever I've never been this good as a human being as I am now and I had to go through hell basically Same with the bricks. So, yeah. um. you, you you don't want to you don't want to be with people who have nothing, no no sadness tattooed into them. There's a there's a uh, wonderful movie called The Big Kahuna with uh, uh, with uh, Spacey and um, I think it's Danny DeVito or is it the other guy I'm, I'm, I think it's Danny DeVito well there's a okay this is a small guy bald guy who actually plays in the mu movie um, with uh, Jack Nicholson uh, uh, where he plays this uh, team star guy was killed by the mafia. Well, they play a beautiful movie called The Big Kahuna, and it's a it's a movie that is basically about a meeting of business people, which is kind of sell lubricant to machines and stuff. And there are three people having dialogues or, and monologues inside one room, and uh, there's a end monologue there by by this that DeVito guy I think it's DeVito I hope it is him because well anyway and uh, he has this dialogue about character and as he says in the end character is what happens when you realize you have done all the things you've done wrong. It starts like this. He talks to this young guy. He says, uh, uh, "It's all about ca uh, yeah." He tell because uh, Kevin Spacey ran out of the room because of an argument. He says, "You know that guy." And uh, Devito says, "This guy is my friend." And of all the people I met, this guy is a friend of mine and it's because he is honest he might be blunt but he's honest he's an honest guy that is why he's his friend and this young guy says oh so you don't mean uh, I have no character and he says no you don't have any character 
because you don't know what you've done wrong. And he says, you say I haven't done anything wrong yet, so I don't have any character. Oh, yes, he says, you've done a lot of stuff wrong. The problem is you just don't know what they are yet. It is when you realize the bad things you've done, and there is absolutely nothing you can do about them. That is when you get character. Then it is that sadness and this realization that you can't change things gets tattooed into your face and you get, uh, get character. Uh, it's not, I mean, I, I didn't, probably didn't say the monologue word by word, but it's basically the tone of the thing. And it's one of my favorite monologues in, in, in history. The second one is actually the monologue in, 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 um, in uh, Blade Runner, the first Blade Runner movie by Rutger Hauer, when he sits on the roof and says, you see what I've seen, all these memories are going to be lost like tears in the rain. And I call it the tears in the rain monologue on the roof there in Blade Runner. It's also one of my favorites. But this, the big kahuna, you have to see that movie. And if you don't, if it doesn't make sense to you, I think actually you have a fucking problem. If, if that movie doesn't touch you on some deeper level, I think you probably have some something to talk to the truth with because every human being which is honest or have, have at least a little bit of honesty in them should be able to, to recognize the truth of what he's saying. There are people who think they are perfect. You know, there are people who doesn't want to have any criticism. There are a lot of narcissists, covert narcissists out there who think they are perfect. There's a lot of artists who are like that, sadly. And these people are spending more time being politically correct within the framework of art than actually be the rebel that they should be. So, uh, yeah. and that came, all of that came out from me painting a brick. And um, now you maybe understand why I find time, the, the thing, the character that I find in this brick so interesting because it actually reminds me of life, of character, of life, of living. It's, it's just well, kind of a microcosm of these things. Uh, yeah. It reminds me of life. It reminds me of the beauty of life and the changes of life and everything. So, so it's, not, it's, not a, it's not a coincidence that I keep on choosing Objects like onions, which is layer upon layer. Apples, which change while I paint them. Uh, other, uh, like craniums. And dead things, things that have gone through, through time. I also had the pleasure of painting a couple of old men. Not any old woman actually yet. Maybe that will be in the future sometime. Uh, yeah. I also love beauty. So I love painting girls. Beautiful women. Because simply because I find them beautiful. I'm a sucker for beautiful things. And despite youthful girls being, not maybe having so much character, there is something fresh and beautiful about them. So, yeah. And, uh, my muse looks like a real woman, and I'm looking forward to paint her, because she is shaped like a real woman. She smells like a real woman. 
and she tastes like wheat pie. So, yeah. It's lovely. Just lovely. <laughs> so now we'll see what happens. We joke around with this cliche, we will see what the future brings. <laughs> That's actually a cliche. That is what people say when uh, when they are uncertain or even sure that their relationship won't last, they say this. Or they want to kind of uh, hedge their bets, as it's called. They don't want to let go because they maybe want to go back there and taste them. Um, Just in case I need this in the future, I will use this phrase. We will see what the future brings. Which means I keeping the door shut but open at the same time for my own pleasure to come back and say, oh, I was wrong when everything else has fallen apart. So fuck that, you know. It's true, we will see what the future brings, but I know what the future will bring. It will bring more frustration, more love, more sadness, more disease, more paintings, more paying my bills, more maybe kids, who knows, you know. Um, but it's all kind of up to us also. You can actually stake out your own direction with the things you do. What you have to do is to start recognizing what lead to what result. And I've been horrible, horrible in this. I've been more distracted than any human being. So as I joke around with this, like it's I wonder how I actually could teach myself to paint at all because I've been so distracted by other things so all the time and still am but when I when I put in the work and my skill level and my capability of seeing into the future uh, makes me able to put in quality time into my work when I and I can around to it. But the goal is to have, the goal would be to have eight to 10 hour work a day, then six hour free and eight hour sleep. Within the six hours, I would do my exercise and uh, be a little bit social. Who knows, maybe have some sex. And cuddling and some quality time. But beside that, I just want to stand here, paint bricks and other things until I drop. As Christopher Hitchens said when he, as you probably said before in this video, again, what are you, when are you going to stop? And he just smiles, his typical smile, as I until I drop. And it's the same thing I'm going to do. I'm going to stand around here painting until I drop. And I hope to drop in a good way. I want to drop in the in the conscious realm. See now it starts to become a little tiny bit more like a brick. See that? And I keep on crisscrossing. If you see how I paint I keep on crisscrossing, crisscrossing, just kind of molding a little bit here, a little bit there. Let me see some more. You just have to be kind of, it's, it's, it has to become a dance. You have to let yourself go, let yourself free. Freedom! So, yeah, that's what I want to do. Okay, I'm going to paint for a while now. 
without filming because I want this movie to become 10 hour long. I haven't done anything here, so now I just see that it kind of twisted a little bit like this. That's also important that you get the kind of the get everything right so it actually doesn't look like like it's, it's bent and all stuff. But all of these things is things that I mold over time anyway, so for now I can actually accept that everything is going to dull. You see how, how the paint now sticks to the surface when I paint? And that's because of the reduce, reduce vernis. So, so. Here I use a mix between ivory black and, uh, and uh, uh, French ultramarine in the shadow. Just a touch of, of black. And then blue, because you don't want to put in only only blue or only black, because black is not a really color and it kind of dies. And uh, blue is also a complementary color to to orange and stuff. So different oranges and different. Yeah, so. That's what I use in the shadow here. Usually, what happens in nature when you see a shadow is that the is that the shadow you see in a cloud or anything is it's kind of a mix between the color in the sky behind the color in the light areas of the of the cloud, and then it's a mix between these two colors. Usually, some kind of yellow or violet, orange, blue color, which is mixed together to become the so-called gray or the shadow in, in, the, in the cloud. The point is that the, the shadow in the cloud isn't gray, it is a mix between two complementary colors, which is very important because if you're going to paint like nature do to get a true feeling of nature that is what you have to do but here there's no bright colors so it's kind of in the more third or not the secondary it's more in the tertiaire it's called tertiaire so it's, it's it's one step down on the you know it's more on the broken color specter there's no pure blue or pure red or pure orange here so it's hard to find a concrete uh, shadow color you just have to kind of feel yourself through it and find the right hue you know. and so my hand I'm going to take my and then keep painting Maybe, 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 maybe. Oh, you see now? Like this, see it? Yeah. Anyway, I hope to see you in the next segment. Um, here we are. I've been doing some work on it. Uh, now I see that I'm getting into a certain amount of trouble because the background and the, or the, the, the stone itself is very, from what it has the same hues all over. So I have a little bit of a problem actually shaping it. Man. But that's the whole thing, you know, it's, it's, it's never easy. And when I get into the last pieces of uh, getting into a deeper kind of level here, it, it gets harder, yeah, it does. And that's where I am now, <clears throat> trying to figure out where to go. 
that I might have to kind of lower it here, get a more perspective in, because I think I did this too thick. It's very hard to say because the nails is so close together. Should be one, two. Yeah, actually, I don't think it's so bad. Maybe I should just shape it up here now. And just I have to work very slowly now. It's uh, the point where everything goes slow. And yeah, I almost kind of regret that I picked this background or picked this surface for it to stand on because it is so. It is so uh, uh, without contrast. Some people might think it's a lot of contrast, but for me it's not that much. But then again, <clears throat> a painting never... I never actually painted something like this easily. Uh, it is more like work in progress. It kind of becomes what it is in a, in a, in a process. It has to do with a perspective, it has to do with a lot of nuance, a lot of shadows, a lot of, yeah, a lot of stuff. And uh, what I need here is some longer, um, like if I work with one piece for many, many hours, I tend to, uh, tend to be able to go very deep. If I'm distracted, it's really hard. So it's very, uh, it's very important to to focus your time and and try to basically get the time to paint. You know, it's. like exercise should I'm not sure if I'm gonna exercise in the morning or if I'm gonna do my exercise after uh, since I also have kind of a girlfriend now it's I have to also kind of make room for that and um, for her which of course is important and therefore I have to focus my, my schedule better. If you're free and can do whatever you like, it doesn't really matter because you're not, you're not really spending or you can spend your time exactly as you please. But I do notice having another person in my life that I really enjoy being with. It's getting a little bit kind of stressful because I'm need to find a way to make these two things come together. Oh, she's a sweetie and she's a very unproblematic girl, so I'm gonna figure it out. She also needs a lot of me time, so it's, it's a very good thing. For her time, of course, not me time. No, she needs some me time, but also her time. Yeah, you know what I mean. But anyway, it's kind of working with this until I get that stone feeling. The most difficult thing, I think, is, is to move it from the paint feeling to the stone feeling. And that lays in, in that the nuance comes very close to one another, that it doesn't seem just like a lot of mushy paint. But Everything is so close together. And, yeah. 
also how to you know, make uh, I may think that I I think that I might make made it a little too bright compared to the background that is also sometimes I think that oh it's it's brighter than a background but then it, it's it's can be the hue it can be the color it can be anything and I can see that it's not really that is so much darker it's more that there's different color that gives it and you can't just make a very dark surface you have to the surface has to have some some uh, texture and some presence or it just becomes a you can of course I could do here just paint in a very dark background without any trace of anything behind it uh, or just dark but it's not how it is here so I, I want to try to go for adding in some of the background and see if I can make it work I was also doing some intensive boxing today I was exercising with this Iranian trainer I have and, uh, I can feel that took a toll <laughs> so. Also, if I if I make it too thick, it seems shorter, and that's also a problem. So I might gonna make it a little bit thinner, and then I have to. Understand why I did like this because it's thickest there and it kind of goes down. And sometimes I actually do the same mistakes as a as a novice would do. I just paint and I think I see something. I think it's thicker. I think it's thinner. And then I'm wrong. So this is what I do now, I'm just going to keep on banging on. Deeper, and it's not boring. 
just more in the blue. And try not to use too much black because if you use a lot of black you tend to kill all the colors. Uh, it becomes very kind of empty. Is that right? Or it's like just a hole. And that is not what I'm after. I want also the background to live. Kind of. This is kind of a basis and then I will add in more color after. Kind of try to bring it back up. Probably boring, I can see that. This is a very slow process, and uh, it's not done in a heartbeat because you have to. There's so many things I have to think about. I have to keep it down, I have to lift it up, I have to get it to kind of sparkle a little bit, I have to kind of find that, that point of. It starts to come alive and thrive. So, yeah. I can't just pour in a lot of paint. actually coming all the way up here and it's more dark here mm -hmm. Slimmer now. It's supposed to be. Yeah, I can do that, of course. It's supposed to be, in a way, real. Yeah, it's supposed to be approximately real size. And right now, it seemed to me that I've been lifting it too much up. Push it down, or as I said, I need to get this up, and it's very hard for me to see it. It's extremely difficult, and it's just a mush here. There's no concrete things to to grab onto in this brick, and that makes it so much harder. So.
push this down. Need to find that stone feeling. much darker there. So that is what I need to do. So I need to, you know, I make this sharp edge here. So it gets more contrast to the side so that will be more subdued into the green. This is reddish, this is more yellow-greenish. And of course I will also do a little bit more glazing and stuff, so it will be easier to get that stone feeling. It's going to be up like this. Anyway, I will just keep banging on and see how it turns out. So. Yay! Voila! I think I'm getting kind of a hang of it, this now. Uh, it starts to find some shape starts to look like a brick and that's a good thing um, now I'm going to do a lot of uh, textures I have to use these small pencils and the ball bristle pencils it's kind of getting shit, getting some uh, stone stone texture getting some details in placing them right so it actually gets the that it becomes uh, the actual brick that I'm painting and that is is uh, quite important because it's kind of easy to get something oh that's a brick you know that's a brick yeah there's no doubt that's a brick but that is not what I'm after I'm after is going to be that brick okay because every brick has its own history and uh, the reason why I paint bricks, which I've talked about before in this video, is the character that time has given, given uh, this brick. And that's where I'm starting to get now. And that is when shape starts to appear and character starts to appear. And it also has to do with the texture I give the surface because it's uh, kind of a uh, it's kind of a woolly. I need to give it this this stony kind of uh, uh, ro rogue surface with kind of micro micro textures. And the details that gives it character, like um, take a small pencil and kind of paint in some little bit of a detail here, okay, and then I go in with with um, this more stony orange color, and I pick up things that is kind of in between there. So it gets more, much more starting to happen in the surface, which is very important for the foil. There's a lot of stuff happening in this brick. There's a lot of stuff to work with. And slowly, incrementally, I give it more and more character. 
and it becomes more and more the brick. The brick. Not a brick, but the brick. And also get this shine right. And the surface now works with the surface and start to get it and to become a little bit more alive. It's very important. So keep the right things down, building the right things up. So yeah. And I have to be careful because I don't want it to be drawn. I want it to have character. I need to get the details, but the details must never be drawn. It must look like a line. It has to be kind of just paint melting into one another so that it looks more like a kind of a real, real surface. So, mm. there's many people who use too much lines and too much black in the shadows and stuff like that. So that's the things to avoid. Yeah. And it's a little bit brighter down here. And a little different shape also. So I'm just keep on banging on. Because then underneath here, there is a shadow. And I, I must avoid having too much oil in the paint also. Because if I put in too much oil, it kind of becomes a little bit too runny. And then I lose that brick feeling. Because then it becomes a lot more watery. I can have that just underneath here in that shadow, but then I have to kind of build up textures here again. Because of course the ground here is quite light, it's a little bit brighter than this. So when it's brighter there, you kind of sense light up on, underneath the brick. So I need to get a shadow there and a little bit of light underneath it to make it stick to the surface. So that's also one of the difficult things. First I bring it up a little bit. When I bring up some light here now, which is actually in the painting, in the in reality this light drags this one down and um, of course yeah and uh, yeah there's a, there's so many things to for me to work on here so but it's just the smallest thing, the smallest changes that in the end will give it what I call a existence, a reason to exist for it to become a painting that have some, some, um, at least some qualities that makes it worthwhile. It's not easy to know if it's worthwhile, but as long, I mean, in the, in the end, we all, as I've been talking about, up to up nauseum, we all go. And that is that is that's, that's sometimes I have that epiphany something I know but I don't know at the same time 
and then sometimes like right now when I said it I really I had a moment where I understood it that this is just temporary everything I do will sooner or later amount to basically nothing in the multiverse so yeah strange and uh, even knowing that it doesn't change my motivation to actually paint paintings and that's the bizarre thing uh, it's like people who believe that if you lose your religion you're going to lose meaning of life but all, all in all it doesn't as long as you do something you love all in all you, you will be quite content even knowing that things won't last forever so yeah it's like 5 in the morning now so I'm gonna quit you know, to give this one day of dry, drying time and then I'm gonna glaze a little bit and then take another step in the right direction and start molding the shadows underneath there and so it kind of sticks more to the surface I can feel I'm becoming manic now, and when I become manic, it's extremely hard to tear myself away from it because I then start to see everything more and more clear, what I have to do, where I need to go about it. But you know, I'm trying to get back to my prison schedule because it was very. It was a very good schedule. So yeah. Anyway, see you in the next segments. So <clears throat> I'm gonna put the red douche furnace on and. Uh, do one of the last layers hopefully I will kind of um, get into kind of deep detail today awesome. and, uh, almost almost get it done we'll see what happens it's not an exact science so I might might screw it up and having to do it all over again not all over again but some more layers that's very hard to know <laughs> but so i'm gonna let this dry for like 10 minutes then i'm gonna put those in place and work with it for like at least eight hours something like that so hopefully I will manage to reach something then yeah okay Okay, uh, I did a little mistake here. I started glazing without putting the camera on, but I don't think it's a catastrophe because I'm not totally finished. Uh, I have to scrape it down and stuff. What I use is, is Ultramarine and, and Alsarine. 
and I just mix them together with my medium, which is 70% uh, uh, turp and then turpentine and uh, uh, linser, cooked linseed oil or this uh, this medium that I, that I buy that is based on linseed oil. And as you can see, I just put in these colors into the canvas here. Uh, I tone it down. I also can use some more bluish. I let it kind of go a little bit towards the blue in the shadows here. So I just tone it down with my with my glaze. And then when you glaze over it, it actually kind of feels like uh, it feels like it's actually in the background. It's it's uh, it's. Uh, and so what I actually did when I was drawing, I figured out I have to do the detail first and then use a scraveur with a lighter pen over it. So I didn't disturb the things I did, I just made the scraveur over it so it kind of put it back in the back side. So it was, it was kind of glazing with, with, uh, uh, with a graphite pen. Uh, here you can see all the textures coming in and then and when I tone it down like this the light area starts to come on and the, the, the more micro things and it starts to, to come more light and what I do now after, the, after this is of course start to work on top of this again with smaller and smaller pencils to get more and more details into into the canvas or into the brick. I, I keep the background down, I don't need to put in so much texture. Oh, but sometimes, I mean, the, in Norway we have called the Nadrum school and sometimes I think they they put in a lot of paint just to make it see, seem very painted. It's almost like they are kind of making all these textures out here and there's a lot of chaos. And to create a kind of an ear, ear perspective, uh, you don't really have to do that. You can be, I like it to be a little bit clearer. Now I take away some of the excess oil also gives a little bit of texture but most of the things in the front here I will paint over in some form anyway and the good thing now is that uh, I let it dry and the, the, the thing I'm, the glaze now will now kind of be pulled into the retouche vernis so that it gets more stuck and it doesn't become that slippery and I also get some oil uh, from the start to to work with so it gives me kind of the medium will now already be on the canvas also the bluish color the reddish will already be on the canvas so I just have to kind of use other colors and stuff to, to enhance it Scraping some light back, and then I also get some texture. So yeah, that is how I do it. Mm -hmm. Now I have to get this more shaped like a brick, so it's going to be a challenge. But I'm always up for a challenge. I think that is basically the main reason why I do anything. That is the challenge. So, yeah. Okay. See you in the next segment when I start painting. So, there we are again. And now, for the detail, I will start where I usually start the light areas to put in some 
details here. Some small things. Start with a little bit more light. I have to be careful. Uh, it's going to be tough. <coughs> the whole thing is going to be quite tough. I hope you can see that I'm not in the way. So, the first touch. Will be and just making this here. So just get this kind of to come a little bit out. These things has to be basically more down in and uh, I'm trying to find because it's it's very it's very neutral the whole thing really so I have to basically add in more mm, a little bit more color it's very hard to see exactly how it is it's not easy but it's, it's more neutral the spread of the light that hits it is more spread out than I usually do <clears throat> but, but let's go, yeah, let's go. Surgeon. need to get that stone feeling and that is why I try to now just to lift it a little bit I don't, I don't, don't need to add so much paint actually I just need to kind of seemingly some of the texture is on top of the texture underneath um, So it actually looks like, especially here, there is a white paint on it, and instead of I just put it on, so it seems like it's on laying on top. These are the things that will give it life and personality. That is so important. Here too. Oh, shadow. Because there's a bump there. A crack. And then I'll have to A 
bump and a crack. <clears throat> also, what is important is the shadow that goes basically underneath, which the light is sent back in order to so like this, and there's a different color up there. Instead of painting anything underneath there, I'll just paint on top of it so it seems like bends. Used the uh, alcohol sienna actually because it's more yellowish. Because I see there is some yellow in it. over there then I use my my uh, uh, cadmium orange and cadmium yellow some white And this is what I will do for the next few hours. And, uh, I'll stand here until I get it right. more white actually exactly down in that now I'm starting to see some places there is some more light and these are the things that give the whole thing a life you know that yeah, the light hits there and enhance it a little bit and so now I see that it also hits here some more orange. And so that is why a painting like this becomes time consuming because you just have to go very, very slow when you come to this point. There's no easy fix and there's no really a limit to how far you can go uh, but and that is basically up to much how much time you have or what skill you have or what your attention are and somebody will go totally um, photorealistic I won't because I'm not a photorealist. So that's a different skill set, I think. Um, I'm more, as I said many times before, I'm more like an 
Impressionist or something in the expressionist. Impressionist. So, You see, I just put it on top and I hold my brush very, very light and I push the paint into it now. I just kind of brush it up on top of it. Now here, yeah. And that's what I will keep on doing for hours on end. Also, which is quite important, is to get this one a little bit brighter. So that the brick actually seems like it's standing on something. I see here there is a lot of oil, sienna. I put some blue into so I get more greenish type of tone. Helps a little bit much green. It's very easy to screw it up actually, so you should be careful. too much and you know it's very hard to get it back because now the medium and the retouche vernis has absorbed each other quite well and it becomes quite sticky so what you put on now is it's quite hard to if you're going to remove it you kind of have to remove it becomes a mush in a way so we have to do the whole thing again I think this was kind of okay I think Let's see there are some that too I can actually go over it with with some so it kind of looks like it's on top yeah, because it is actually, there's a lot of stuff happening in that glass plate and it's on top, so it seems like that that is actually the glass and then I have to in between enhance this again you know, the, the light that comes down like this now it kind of starts to come alive a little bit, you know, more subtle. And this is basically it, you know, this is what I will, this is what to do. So. And I enjoy it so much, it's strange, you know, how much I actually enjoy making this getting it right, lifting it up, pushing it down, lifting it up, pushing it down, finding the right color, finding the right light, so many things that gives it life and meaning, because that is what I'm, I mean the technique in itself gives it a certain amount of meaning, because if you can do something that actually has some quality, you're adding more quality to the world. 
sounds very pretentious, but it's kind of true. Every every book, even good or bad, you know, it's every 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 effort of a human being. It kind of pushes the bar. For, for not not on a on a scale that I, you create something new, something that people haven't done before. But you create something with a little bit of aesthetics and add a little bit of positivity to the world and then you combine that with for trying to be a decent person and I think that would be the recipe for living the good life you know that is what stoicism says and that is what science says. And uh, yeah, I saw some documentary about this Alan Gerd guy that was the Lair Commandant in Plus of Plus of Camp in the Schindler's List. And some of the movie actually wasn't accurate. He was removed long before the camp closed and had to dig up all these corpses and stuff, but the guy, I mean, the guy went around in in the camp enjoying killing. He was even tried for it because uh, even the SS had their standard. There's like, you don't kill your workforce, okay? You don't kill people randomly that aren't used up. It's like if you have a car plant and you have a certain amount of skilled workers you don't you don't kill them for fun that's just because you're hungover or had a, had a bad day because you know the fabric is gonna go badly <laughs> so that was the reasoning it wasn't a human cost or a human but he was actually tried for sabotaging <laughs> the workforce in the camp and he was removed from the camp and was actually in a in a psych ward when he was caught he was basically yeah he he was not a happy camper to put it that So, I mean, some people, some people have that legacy, and um, most people, I guess, don't do much that will be remembered, but just being decent, trying to do something that is positive, should actually constitute a good life, a lived good life. Like my mother and father, they have been good parents. You know, and, uh, they have um, helped people and they have been kind and they haven't made, my mother has made a lot of ceramics and stuff, sadly she stopped doing it. And she was quite good, so it's a sad she stopped. But they haven't really done much to be remembered on the ages, except from being my brother and me parents. But they have lived good lives, you know. They added something positive to the to the human universe. With that series of Brian Cox called the Human Universe is actually good. Uh, if you have seen it. So this is what I do, it's kind of a little little poetic step in the right direction and it gives me pleasure 
while I exist and that is good enough for me. So that was today's philosophy lesson and painting. So now I'm gonna turn this off and keep doing my work and next time I will zoom in so you can see what I do with the stone up close. So here I am. I actually gotten this to look like a brick now. I'm gonna do some of the last things in it. Uh, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. I'm gonna work with <clears throat> what I'm working with now is basically trying to get the brick to become more brick. And it's not that easy, actually, um, because I need to give it that st the stone feeling. And basically how I think is I try to follow directions and uh, uh, give it some more texture. I also when I paint, I hold the brush quite loose. In the place I want some more realistic texture, I, I try to hold it loose. I just need to get a corner, actually. Um, when I hold it loose, I basically... What happens then is that I create small lumps or small brushes and brush strokes that basically becomes almost like it it is the texture is on the brick. Uh, it's uh, I kind of drag like this, drag it down, and I crisscross. I kind of crisscross, and I kind of push it down again. I actually made a, a video on a stream on Instagram. I might add that one to this video. And if I did, it was before this video. I haven't managed to download it. Okay, sorry about that. It wasn't any more space in the. So, there we are, trying to find a way around. Now, what, what is, as I said, important when you want to get that stone feeling? It is all about touch. How much pressure do you put on, on, the, on the brush? It's, <clears throat> it's like playing the piano. If, if you only play the piano with one pressure, it will kind of sound very monotone or very flat and dead. A good pianist actually adds in, uh, in his own pressure, his own touch. Uh, to create and in a way it is kind of like that uh, and but of course this is paint 
so it's different there that you are actually working with a physical object on a canvas but anyway the the principle is the same you have to learn to use the brush you have to learn to learn the touch you have to learn to foresee the different pressures and colors and to get the right texture the right uh, yeah texture and structure and, yeah. for every detail I put in now it will become a little bit more Like a, like a stone. It's funny, I, the last, when I was filming the live on Instagram, I was fasting and I've been drinking a lot of lemon water and coffee and felt very nice. But then I did a couple of mistakes. I ate some sugary stuff. And now I can feel my brain is not working right. It's just a mush. My eyesight, everything. So it's so important actually what you eat. Not having any food in my stomach when I work with my paintings is actually the best thing. So everything from exercise, eating, everything should come after I've done my painting. So the, 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 the thing I use the most energy on is to paint. Now exercising is easy because it's just physical work. But doing paintings like this is is work on a totally different level. So you have to be very focused, very sharp. So yeah, I did that mistake today and I regret it. But sometimes we do mistakes, you know, it's, we are human ape. I'm not perfect, sadly. I just have to ride the sugary storm and hopefully it won't affect my painting too much. So many details in this, it's just amazing actually how much small things there are in a brick like this. All these small things, this time and touch, it's the law of thermodynamics, as it's called.
Sonia. Finding that sweet spot between too much, too little. It's really hard. Most difficult thing. I kind of want, when people go into it, I want them to kind of have to look. Oh, there's another detail. Oh, there's another. You know, I want them to be kind of dragged in by detail. Always becomes quite silent when I go really deep. And the best thing now is actually just to put on some music and uh, stop talking, stop thinking, just go deeper and deeper into that flow and uh, just work. This was too drawn. I have to now shake that up a little bit. That is a thing you also learn to see when you get better. Is you are able to see what is more too drawn and has too many lines and stuff like that. thinking now while I'm kind of painting trying to think how to solve the different things to give it that last schwung schwung schwing shower to and then
so difficult to choose exactly how bright it is, how dark it is, compared to the brick. You see how slowly I'm working now. I'm trying to pick off bits and pieces of the impressions from the brick and just add more and more detail. Uh, for example, I work in directions that try to crisscross and find the right way to kind of build out the sculptural feeling in it. Uh, it's basically just a back and forth process, a very silent process, a very focused process. And, uh, yeah, you have to focus yourself, focus on how you use the brush. You have to focus on the texture and how, like, pull, pull, and you see something happening there and you pull down and you create, create with all these different movements you more and more create something that comes closer and closer to, to the real object. What I usually compare it with is a piece of driftwood. You throw, uh, I've probably said a hundred times before, but you put, take a piece of wood, you throw it into the sea, and you find the same. You can even uh, if you have a tread or a rope, you can throw it into the sea and you will leave it there to the elements for a few years and you come back, you drag it on and you see all the things that happened to it while it was in, in the sea, all the elements, all the animals and bacteria and all, all the things that happened to it, the stream, the difference of temperature, everything is kind of shaping an object and, and um, it becomes a beautiful artwork and in some sense of way it's, it's basically how you have to think when you paint it's, it's a result of every time you touch it, every time you see something, every time you add something it becomes more and more that object that you are actually trying to paint. So that's how I think, and you, then you have to think about the directions, the, uh, you know, the texture, and also the color, and the neons. So it's many things at the same time you have to think about when you are trying to create something that's going to feel natural, like a piece of driftwood. Yeah, anyway, that's the, I think that's an, a very important lesson. So next time I'm going to go even closer, but from now I'm going to just take a break and paint without. And voila! <clears throat> Here we are. Now I'm going to do the last uh, kind of touch up. Just going to zoom in a little bit here so you see what I'm doing. As you can see, it turned kind of more orange now when I zoomed in for some reason. It's always difficult to get it right, uh, the right color in my glasses, sorry to say. Um, so what I've been doing is just working, touching up, trying to focus it. Um, as I said in the last segment, so <clears throat> also want to, to 
I'm a little, a little bit more blue here or greenish because I see makes the difference between because it's dark up here and I should actually since this is a as you can see it's very dark there but it, and also in the picture or in in reality sorry but here it's it's brighter and that is just because you know the reflection of the light in the glass is totally different but it's a little bit more bluish I'm gonna go in here and add some blue but actually also pull out the orange in the in the brick in the mirroring of the brick um, yeah. so of course it's not going to be any texture or anything in the reflection of the brick and I'll even tone it a little bit more down the texture is up here the thickest colors is as I say up there so but I'm going to you know get things to come alive without competing with each other that is basically what I'm trying to do. If it competing, competes too much, it's, it kind of loses its potency. So, yeah. Uh, it's very tempting to put in some brighter color there. But it's not like it is in reality. I have over, I have exaggerated the orange here a little bit because I kind of wanted to have the right address to one another or if I do too much it's gonna I, I'm gonna kill it and there is a grueling process to getting it back in a way so I'll be a little bit careful what I do Gonna let it dry now. I'm gonna glaze a little bit tomorrow, maybe because I put in so much, so much color now and stuff that kind of will dry pretty fast. So it's a good thing. So. quite tired now, it's like 5 in the morning in Norway and uh, see I'm reaching my limits of how much I want to work so what I've been doing here the same thing just trying to mold it bit by bit Do anything crazy. Don't do anything that will kind of make ruin it or anything. Just adding some strategic things that make it kind of come alive a little bit more. Mm -hmm. 
use. This one. Very dangerous if you do too much, it just collapses the whole thing. Just and uh, I know it's kind of a <clears throat> you just do a little bit too much when it comes to shadows and light, and if the distance between too much and too little is just so subtle. No. It takes nothing to ruin it. Especially if it's a face. That's that's really stressful in the end when you are come to a point where you are basically reaching your skill wall and trying to get in that last touch and uh, it is nice, it is good but you're just going to do a tiny bit more and then eight hours later you're screaming Feeling that you have destroyed everything and you have to do everything again. And there's not much that can differentiate those things from each other. Not much at all. I'm touching it with my fingers. So annoying. Let's see now. Touch it all the time. Also, to get this behind here, I just take this and I scrape away the glaze that I used, and I just bring the what's underneath back again. And then it's kind of the glaze is still there, but it's kind of and then just the background. Exactly to that point, and I want it. So now it kind of explains the background. Like this. And now we are going to off like this. Make the background glide more into another. Just create some, some nice textures. Maybe it's a little bit too bright there. Or I just have to enhance it a little bit more here. I just don't. May sound brutal. Yeah, now it's kind of hangs more together. 
think, yeah, see there's something behind here. That was just a glaze with some blue, and it, I evened it out so different things doesn't collide too much. And here is actually going to be even brighter. Yeah, I think that was nice. Actually, yeah. Okay, I'm going to zoom out again. maybe tomorrow I think I'm gonna sign it and show you what I how I do that and then I can show you the painting with the frame tomorrow I try always try to sign it Down here, I sign it with my two two initials, like the K and the A. Boom, and then my name is actually Big Solon. It would be probably impossible for English speaking people to pronounce that. So you don't have to. V. Signing is actually quite difficult. It's not that easy. This was horrible. This one too. Nah, fuck it. I'll do that tomorrow. Yeah, but do it when you're not looking because you have to concentrate. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna maybe paint a little bit more on it tomorrow. But. Yeah. So. We'll see. Anyway. And voila, <clears throat> here it is, the painting, the finished product. I haven't signed it yet actually. I'm gonna do that when I come to my hometown, Kalme, in my barn studio instead. Uh, I couldn't actually, I forgot about it actually. So, here it is, here's how it came out. I think I managed to reach the, the brick feeling. Uh, a good way to see it actually is to turn it upside down and you, you can actually see how gravity, if you have painted in gravity, it's usually a good sign. The shine here and everything. I think I got it. It's very fresh so it's quite hard to actually photograph it because there's so much shine in it. And this is of course the famous brick. And uh, yeah, I think I managed to at least get close to real, close to it. Now I hope that you give a thumbs up, leave a comment, go to my Patreon, support my work. I need all the support I can. I uh, have been away for a year in a low security prison because I have a stupid hobby rebuilding replica guns into shootable guns and the police didn't like that very much 
so I had a that's why I've been away from this channel so please if you can it would be nice if you could support me a little bit while I rebuild okay Let's hope to see you in the next video or on Patreon